So I've tossed heads three times in a row. And the question to you is, what are my chances of getting ahead in my next toss of the coin? It's a game of probabilities and your options are 0%, 6.25%, 12.5%, 50% or 100%. Hi everyone, my name is Shankar Nath and in this video, we shall understand the influence of opinions, biases and beliefs on your investing decisions. We shall do that by studying three misapprehensions and behaviors which might seem to have originated from an Ocean's Eleven playbook. And these are one, the gambler's fallacy, two, the inverse gambler's fallacy, and thirdly, the retrospective gambler's fallacy. If you haven't heard or read about these three fallacies, then you're gonna love the material that we have put together. And we'll definitely come back to that coin toss question but if you've already worked that out, don't forget to type in the answer in the comments box below. Let's get started. On 18th of August, 1913, a phenomenal event happened at the Monte Carlo Casino in Monaco. The action was at the roulette table where one of the gamblers noticed that the ball had fallen on the black pockets some eight to nine times in a row. This got people interested and the gambler's fallacy kicked in. What's the gambler's fallacy? It is the belief that if something happens more frequently now, it is less likely to happen in the future. For example, if a batsman scores three centuries in a row, people believe that he's more likely to fail in the fourth innings. However, in reality, the outcome of the fourth innings is completely independent of the previous three trials. So at this casino, since the ball had fallen so many times on the black pocket, people started to bet that the ball will fall on a red pocket very soon. Incidentally, the ball for some reason was very stubborn and to the continued horror and amazement of the gamblers, it went on to fall on the red pockets in the 11th attempt, the 12th, the 13th, the 14th, the 20th and the 21st attempts. Now, this is where it gets interesting. As the ball continued to fall in the black pockets, the gamblers continued to put more and more money on the red pockets, assuming that the ball will fall on a red pocket soon enough. So did the ball finally fall in a red pocket? Of course, yes, it did. The ball did fall on a red, but not until the 27th spin of the roulette wheel. So while the people who gambled on the red in the 27th spin took home a lot of money, a much greater number of people lost a lot more money due to the long streak of blacks. This event was truly remarkable and it is for this reason that the gambler's fallacy is also called the Monte Carlo fallacy. Now let's not stop here. Let's try to deduce what might have happened here using probabilities. So we all know this, on the first spin there is a 50% probability of the ball landing on a black pocket and there is a 50% probability of the ball landing on a red pocket. It's the second spin where the misapprehension problem or fallacy really starts. Most people start thinking that since the first spin resulted in a black, the probability of the second spin also being a black is 50% multiplied by 50% or half multiplied by half which comes to 1 by 4 or 25%. This means that the probability that most people calculate of the second spin being a red is 1 minus 25% which comes to 75%. This is the problem because spin 1 and spin 2 are actually two completely independent events just as will be the case with spin 3, spin 4, spin 5 and so on. This means the probability of the ball going into a black pocket or a red pocket in any spin will always be the same which is 50% or 1 by 2. So let's go back to the 1913 game and deduce the probabilities there based on this fallacy at different stages of the game. So at the sixth spin, the actual probability of getting a red is 50%. But because of the gambler's fallacy, the people at the casino calculated the probability of a red as 98.43%. Likewise, at the 15th spin, the miscalculated probability of a red was 99.996% while the actual probability was still 50%. 99.996% is like almost guaranteed red and we are still only talking about spin number 15. And at the fateful 27th spin, the gamblers who bet on red believed that the probability of the ball falling in a red pocket was 99.9999993%.
In other words, they were saying that the chance of the ball falling on a black is just 1 in 133 million. Absolutely insane, especially when the correct probability is 1 in 2 and someone calculates it as 1 in 133 million. Okay, so now let's get back to the question we started this video with. So there were five options. 0%, 6.25%, 12.5%, 50% and 100%. If you had used the gambler's fallacy, you would have calculated a probability of 6.25%. But now we know that it would have been the wrong answer and the right answer is 50%. Now the gambler's fallacy is not restricted to just coin tosses or the roulette table, but happens in many other scenarios and in the most casual manner. For example, we might say a statement like, even in investing, I must have heard this like a hundred times, something like, the market has been going up for the last four days, so aaj pakka girega. In fact, let's do this. Let's create a nifty 50 version of what happened at the Monte Carlo Casino. So what we've done here is we've taken the daily nifty 50 closing data from the year 2003 onwards, and I've mapped out the series of days when the market went up. So the total number of trading days in our data is 4,657. Of these, there have been 699 occasions when the Nifty 50 closed higher than the previous day's closing for three days in a row. To keep the flow going, we started increasing the hot streak days. So four days in a row happened 371 times, five days in a row was 187 times, six days, seven days, eight days, 9 days, wow, that happened like 12 times, 10 days in a row was 4 times, and the highest streak that has been recorded on the Nifty 50 was 11 straight days, which happened once when the Nifty 50 climbed from 4,518 points on 14th of September 2007 to 5,210 points on 3rd of October 2007. I wonder how many people might have done some short selling at some point during those 11 days, maybe starting as early as day 5 or day 6, thinking up girega, up girega, up girega. The point here is that the gambler's fallacy is all around us and tends to distort good decision making. What we need to understand is that these fallacies are behavioral in nature and have no scientific basis even if your mind tries to build some logic or reasoning to suit the situation. But having said this, one thing that is not behavioral and is purely scientific is the importance of you liking, subscribing and commenting on this video, which will help us immensely with the YouTube algorithm. The inverse gambler's fallacy is, as the name suggests, the opposite of the gambler's fallacy and is an equally tricky situation. It explains a behavior where the gambler believes that a series is bound to continue for some more time. To illustrate, in our coin toss example, an inverse gambler's fallacy would have kicked in if I had thought that since the next result, after the three consecutive heads would also have been a head. The problem here is that the gambler presumes that the next event or the next coin toss has some kind of a memory of the past results which will have a bearing on the future outcomes. I know it sounds weird, but how many times have we seen people following others on the pretext of uska luck acha chal rahe? In investing, the most common form of inverse gambling fallacy is this practice of chasing performance wherein investors select mutual funds on the basis of the last year's performance. This is a very common practice and the assumption here is that the present year's best funds will continue to perform the next year as well. In fact, in a recent video on the ET Money YouTube channel, we presented much evidence that chasing the best performing funds does not give the best results. If you haven't watched that yet, please do watch it. I'm sure there's a lot to learn from there. I'll be sure to leave a link to that video in the description below. The last of the three fallacies is the retrospective gambler's fallacy. This fallacy reveals a behavior where people use present conditions to conclude what might have happened in the past. To put it simply, if the gambler observes multiple successive heads, he concludes that the previous unknown flip would have been a tails. Let me take another example around it. In fact, this happens to me sometimes when I switch on the TV and a cricket match is going on. 
So let's say there is a match which is halfway done. Say we are at over number 28 out of a possible 50 overs. Now I haven't seen the batsman score yet, but in the very next ball, this batsman hits a six. The first thought I have is that this batsman who has just hit a six has probably been playing for the last eight to 10 overs and he's now set and which is why he went for a six. Just think about what happened here. The retrospective gambler's fallacy is at work here because I could not fathom a scenario that the batsman could have just come to the crease and might have hit the next ball for a six. In other words, I assumed certain past conditions based on what I presently saw. In fact, let me give you an investing example here. Most of us read business newspapers to keep ourselves updated and often take investing decisions based on what we might have read. So when the headlines read something like the GDP is down this quarter, it does not give us any hint as to where the GDP was in the previous quarter. But the problem is that the retrospective fallacy kicks in and many people assume that the GDP was up in the previous quarter and that's why the headline is saying that the GDP is down this quarter. This is a mental or a behavioral issue because it's truly possible that the GDP was down in the previous quarter and it is down in this quarter itself. Okay, let's take another example. When someone says XYZ stock has done really well this year, most people assume that the stock did not do well in the previous year, which may be true or which may completely be false. And with this, we come to the end of this episode. Behavior is as much a part of good investing as our valuations. We are often surrounded by our own beliefs, prejudices and opinions which come in the way of better investing. And while eliminating these is next to impossible, a good knowledge of these will certainly help tip the scales in your favor. I sure hope you liked this video and will draw many learnings from the case studies, data and insights presented. Don't forget to subscribe, like, comment and share this video with your friends and colleagues. Thank you for watching and I look forward to catching up with you next week with another insightful video. Until then. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme related documents carefully.